Okay, so the agenda is actually uh, quite simplified today because I think we're taking a step back. Um, and uh, the reason we're taking a bit of a step back is last call there seemed to be a bit of a division. Um, on the one hand, we got fairly detailed on an abstract level about how we were going to talk about routes and what the relationship was between a root as a geographical entity versus a root as a sort of activity that people participate in. Um, but then on the other hand, there seemed to be a lack of clarity um, about what people are actually doing with roots and what kind of use cases we were hoping to support. Um, and so on the one hand, we were getting quite detailed. And on the other hand, I think we were, we were losing the thread a little bit. Um, so I was hoping with this meeting just to take a step back a little bit um, and discuss two items. The first is that I shared a spreadsheet yesterday and it's linked to in the slides. Um, I just went and I did a preparatory survey of uh, Roots data as it's currently published in the wild. So it's just a spreadsheet with 10 website web pages on it basically and I did a sort of basic assessment of the information architecture there. Uh, so I was hoping to review that. Um, and then secondly on the agenda, um, for the booking spec, we had a big meeting where everybody came together and worked a little bit on developing use cases in the first instance. Uh, Nick certainly indicated that this was a useful exercise. So I think we're going to try to rerun that for root specifications and take a step back, all get together and look at what we're actually trying to do, what kind of um, behavior we're trying to support with version one of the root specification, um, and then take a look at what we will lie in future for roots two. Um, so we need to do a little bit of meeting planning. Most of that won't happen in this call, but we can maybe take a feel for people's initial availability. And then of course there will be any other business at the end. So uh, initial data exploration. Um, if you click on that link in the slides, uh, hopefully you've all got access to that now. Um, you should see a spreadsheet, which I will attempt to pull up here. Um, is everyone able to see the roots data exploration matrix? Yeah, I can see it on your screen. I couldn't click on the link, but we can see it on your screen. Oh, okay, right. Um, but that's fine. Uh, if we need the link, uh, you can add it to the chat, maybe. Sure, yeah. In fact, I'll do that now just to. <laughs> I might regret this decision. Uh, where's my Zoom window? Nick, Escape. help me. Escape. Escape. Mm -hmm. oh. There we go. Okay, cool. Okay, go away now. <laughs> um, okay, so looking at the looking at the spreadsheet either on my screen or through the link. Um, first of all, just a sanity check to make sure I've got a representative uh, bunch of sites covered here. Uh, so the left-hand column, column A, is Lee's original list of attributes for what we would want to include in the first version of the root specification. Um, the first thing that jumps out at me is how thin, thinly populated these are looking across the rest of the columns. Um, but the organizations that I took a look at were Forestry England, um, National Parks, which seems to actually be a number of independent organizations kind of joined together into a trust, uh, the Canal and River Trust, Explore Kent, um, the National Trust Ramblers, uh, an organization that showed up on the comments in GitHub called Walkies, which is specifically for dog walkers, I take it, um, but was uh, cited as an instance of best practice. Oh, hello everybody, I see you're all on the spreadsheet now. Um, Ordnance Survey, British Cycling, and uh, an organization called Everything Cycling, which I got to via Sustrans. So those are the 10 organizations I accessed trying to get a sense of roots data in the wild. Um, so I guess my first question is, what have I missed? Um, Go Jauntly is a, an app, so we, I guess you haven't really found it via the internet. So you, um, you could look, download our app and see kind of the content that we've got. I think it's 
a lot of these are covered. Right, okay. Any other suggestions? Um, British Cycling has, uh, are they in there? No. Yeah, they're in there, yeah. Oh, they are, oh, yeah. sorry. Um, um, Ordnance Survey? Yep, they're in there. I will look at the spreadsheet again. Sorry. <laughs> Let's all just make suggestions that you've already put in there, shall we? <laughs> confirming that they, they were the right uh, the right guesses. Um, so oh, yeah. oh, one a Google like Google Maps is that a thing or not really? I suppose they don't really have routes, but oh, park run, park, ah, run. Yeah. park run, yeah. They have routes mm -hmm. for each of their right. Their yeah, run, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And ramblers to that effect. Uh, they're in there. Are they okay? Sorry. Um, but yeah, park run, go jointly. Um. Oh, um, maybe um, maybe you could check run together in case mm -hmm. they do have mm -hmm. route data. Yeah. Athletics. Pretty sure run together do have routes. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um. What about um, our um, birds? Uh, oh, RSPV. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bird acronym. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we'll definitely check out bird, bird acronym. Um, yep, okay. I just found a very cute American site called Baby Bisons, um, which we might need to refer to. Um, <laughs> um, about things like sort of Strava and things like that for running, running routes? I don't, I'm not familiar with Strava. Um, but, uh, it's quite popular and so you can connect like your, if you have a smart watch or a fitness watch with gps you can connect oh right okay yeah phone and then you can yeah. as you're cycling or running around you can record your route and it's sort of like a community you can chat with other people and see, okay. see what yeah. other routes other people have done and things like that oh, okay i'm familiar yeah then there's a few applications yeah, that fall into that, that's cool. that's yeah. Fall yeah. that yeah. okay so yes yeah, so similar to strava check that out as well yeah okay. go, go on and connect have a similar one mm -hmm. Okay, um, so that's more work to do there. Um, and then I was thinking of just reviewing the routes that I've listed out, really, um, and getting a feel from the community about how useful these things actually are, um, and what, what would be changed ideally. Um, I've listed them out in the spreadsheet more or less in ascending order of complexity. So the population of attributes gets thicker as you move towards the right on the spreadsheet. Um, the other thing I draw your attention to is if you look down at the bottom, um, which I irritatingly can't do just at the moment, um, there's another tab called additional attributes or something like that. Um, yeah, because actually it seemed like almost all of the sites had some attributes that we don't have in the initial outlining of the spec. So if we could maybe talk a little bit about whether or not these things are worth supporting, that would be a valuable exercise, I think. Um, so starting off with Forestry England, if you click on the link there for the Dragonfly Trail, um, you'll see that it's actually tremendously simple. Um, there's not a great deal to it. Um, we've got a very brief description of the trail. Um, We've got some uh, heading trail information. Uh, follow the way markers is the instruction basically. So go there, uh, follow the route, <laughs> you're done. Um, grade easy access, trail length one mile, 1.6K. Um, that is about it really. Um, a couple of points that jumped out to me. The first one is a kind of conflation between ease of use and gradient. Uh, so that the two are almost synonyms for each other. That seems to be um, fairly common across the sites. Um, there's a lot of different degrees of granularity about how much, how tightly people describe grade. Some people will do it in terms of a number of meters rise per kilometer. Um, others will be you know, easy, difficult, hard, that kind of thing. Um, just as a measure of the arduousness. Things that this has that we didn't include in the specification um, include, if you look at the 
description here, actually, there's kind of a, a brief description, which is the title Dragonfly Trail, and then there's a slightly longer description underneath. And that's true across almost all of the websites that I looked at. Um, in fact, there's some kind of summary information and then there's a full description. Um, sometimes the full description will cover like literally five to 10 paragraphs. Um, so it's probably useful to make a distinction there, I think. Um, any comments on that particular page? I, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was, I was just about to say I'd be particularly interested in hearing from Helen, so. <laughs> Yes, sorry, I'm on, I'm, on, um, I'm on mute because the office is really noisy. So um, I put myself off mute for this particular moment. But yeah, so if you need me to talk, just call me because I have to, it's really noisy here today. Um, I think the, um, this is one of our simple, more simple tr uh, routes anyway. The, when, when we did the, the grading and the easy access, I, um, we were aiming for like easy to understand as opposed to highly technical. If you see what I mean, I think some of the cycling routes have got more technical descriptions in terms of, they, you know, the, what grade equals easy and things like that. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit more standard as opposed to walking. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, yeah, and I mean, that, that's why really the, the bit where it says the flat easy walk for children's play areas, I think that's probably, you're right, it's probably very key because people will probably just want to see it at, at a glance what, what they're looking for. If you see what I mean, that's why they, that's there so that people can skim through when they find it and they should search this thing and they can, you know, include or exclude from their thoughts straight away. Right, so there's a value, there's a value to the simplicity there, that in fact it is kind of a, you know, this is, this is something I can do or it's not, and I want to assess that quite quickly. Yeah, and because we're, we're the, a lot, you know, it's good for, to, to distinguish the audience. Obviously this one is, it's appealing for people, with, you know, push chairs and wheel, wheelchairs, it's, it's an accessible route. So it's quite, you know, to have the words like flat and easy in it, it's really key from that perspective. And so does, does easy access have a, a precise for Forestry England? So if it says easy access, does that mean wheelchair accessible or does it, is it a bit vaguer than that? Mm, I think it's a bit vaguer, but I can actually, I can find out and, and contribute to that. But um, off the top of my head, I don't know if it's like got a technical, you know, a load of sort of specifications behind that or whether it was just used as a simple way of explaining what the proposition was. I guess I guess the picture gives you that information, really, doesn't it? That's yeah, yeah. Strong, strong implicit message there. Um, okay. Um, I just had one more comment about that page, um, which is from a data perspective. It would be really help. Um, I know, and I know it says it in the text, which is great. But that wheelchair pushchair kind of accessible. I guess we. Um, we might want to pull that out as a kind of data field more than just having it in the text. I mean, obviously having the text is very useful, but having it as a field as well within that data, I guess would be probably quite useful as well for some innovators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we do see that in some of the, some of the other ones, there will be sort of not a field, but they're all going to be tags. So there will be kind of a, a blob of words down at the bottom and one of them will be wheelchair accessible or, or something like that, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in the other specifications, um, we've used um, name and description mm -hmm. as the kind of short name and description of the long, um, more detailed description, mm -hmm. which in this, um, just for this website, seems to match what you would have as Dragonfly Trail and what the Python. Mm -hmm. That's what you'd expect from the director of the name and then the description underneath. Mm -hmm. It's quite helpful. So, and also, image is actually potentially a field. Yeah, I mentioned that in the additional attributes there. I'm sorry, yeah. I couldn't see image. I just have it um, Is it in there? Well, it's, it's just in column J, I just, because all of them seem to have an image and we didn't have a field for it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, J on the additional information sheet there. Ah, okay. yeah. sorry, I, I missed this a whole other thing. Right. Yeah, so, um, okay, yeah. So, I mean, there is an image, um, and in the modeling spec, there's an image kind of standard way of describing images. So. And indeed, it's often, it's often an, an array. If you look at some of the other ones, it'll be you know, right. several pictures, one for each way, way point or something. Right, nice. Um, okay. um, actually, I was thinking we could maybe jump over to, since we've got Tim here, uh, we can move to the Explore Kent, um, just to talk through that a little bit. Oh, hold on, I've lost it.
I'm very bad at looking at my own screen. This is what's coming out. Clearly. Oh, the one right in front of me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, so this one has got, um, this one is a much more complicated uh, model, much more full model. Um, I'll just go through it sort of from top to bottom, and then if you want to jump in, Tim. Yeah, and, I can uh, try and it. So it's slightly a partner service to right, my right, team, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, that might be useful um, yeah. inside as well. But, you know, yeah. as a partner service, you'd find useful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as Nick said, we've got the we've got a, a name or title at the top. Um, we've we've got an explicit um, acknowledgement of who created it, which is interesting. That's, this is almost unique amongst the sites that I looked at. Um, very often unattributed or just kind of implicit in the site that it's on. Uh, um, a little tag here just floating around saying parking. Um, and then a really quite extended description of what the walk consists of. Um, over towards the right, we've got, we've got a feature which got, got pointed out in the GitHub issue, um, root type circulars. That's indicating that it loops back to its starting point. Um, you've got the distance in metric and imperial. And then quite a detailed description of how to get there, basically. Uh, so we've got the postcode that you want for SatNav purposes, I guess. Uh, town, district, nearest train station, um, which I think is unique to Explore Kent. We've got a map reference on the OS Explorers, which I think is only on Explore Kent and unsurprisingly on Ordnance Survey. Um, got a star rating, which is quite nice. Um, I was not clear who gave it that rating. But <laughs> I'll have to find out. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and then we've got a Google map, which is purely indicating the start point. Um, and then lots of nice pictures. Um, so it's fairly full. Um, have you, do you know how this has been received? Um, I think it's fairly, fairly well. Mm -hmm. um, there is a bit, bit of a mixture. I I think this is a number of different routes, and I think some of them probably won't be, have quite so mm. full information as that. Um, and then some, which I think that one might do, also have a download of um, mm -hmm. like a, a map or a pamphlet. Sometimes there's a pamphlet or something which is about the walk and the area and things mm -hmm. you can look out for and that sort of thing. Um, and then I think there are others as well, um, which will have more information about the uh, on the right hand side about the accessibility. Oh, okay, right. Um, and the access and whether it, whether the route's flat or and whether there are you know gates and that that sort of information. But okay. I, I think it's they're not necessarily exactly the same fields on every single walk. Right. Slightly okay. different. And where where does that variation in data fullness come from? Um, uh, again, I'll probably have to sort of check because I'm not 100% sure where, how they collect the information where it comes from, but I imagine from the sort of, a lot of time it'll be from the source mm -hmm. um, to where they, where they get the information from. And, oh, okay, and, so you... and some of them, they put, um, they'll have staff who, who go out and sort of take pictures and walk the route and, um, and sort of Almost um, go through it themselves to check it and what have you, and then there'll be others where they, they've just sort of been sent it or seen it somewhere, or, or um, that sort of idea. Okay, so it's quite disparate. So they, yeah. somebody's got a guidebook and they're like, oh, yeah. this looks nice, yeah, so I'll contribute exactly. that. And, yeah. Okay, so it's like an almost like an internal crowdsourcing sometimes. Yeah, and they, uh, they're through social media and things. And, stuff, oh, okay. you know, um, and then they tie in with other, because it's um, part of Kent County Council, so tie in with some other. Parts of King County Council as well, like Public Rights Away, and mm -hmm. um, other other local groups and organisations which might might um, share information. Okay, so there's a kind of it's an informal process. I guess, yeah, a lot of different as, as, um, as far as I'm aware, but yeah, like I say, I'm not exactly right. involved with that myself. That's um, it's sort of a partner service to the team I'm in. So um, yeah, I'd have to double check exactly how to do it with, with colleagues. Okay, but that's, that's, that's not an implausible um, model. Um, and 
I, one thing that I think that's interesting that that points to is also, it seems like it could be that you start with a skeleton and then you kind of enrich it as mm -hmm. time goes by. So yeah. you start off with, I read about this in a book somewhere, I heard about it on Facebook, yeah. and then it sort of gets filled in over time. But, okay. Um, so it's a work in progress. And this kind of confirms something that Helen said, I guess, about there being a lot of variation even amongst mm -hmm. individual publishing organizations that yeah. Forestry England or, or Kent might be. Yeah. So different. So I guess that's the other piece of exploration to do is to look at more sites, more pages within each site mm -hmm. to, yeah. to see how internally consistent things are. Yeah. Um, I was just going to mention that uh, you might want in your data set like the origin of the walk like because if you're using the creator field for maybe the user who's created it in our case or it might be that explore kent created this one but actually another walk's created by uh i don't know like another location in kent and they've, they've created the walk on explore kent's behalf but you might want another field that's like origin or i don't know like the platform name it's, it's kind of obviously at the top of all of the Excel columns, but it needs to be maybe its own field. Right, yes. Yeah, so it might be different from the created by field. Yeah, so it's created by some kind of organization. Uh, yeah, and in our case, it would be the user because it's quite, there's like, we've got quite a few user, same as the Ramblers, I think, loads of the user walks. And, um, and if you look at the Ramblers one, um, which I'll Pop over to, um, yeah. They've actually got a a triple level. In that, if memory serves, there's obviously it's on the Rambler's site, but then there's somebody called the Root Developer, Robert Haslam, and then there's a the Root Checker. So there's um, yeah, three three levels there of who's responsible for the Root in a sense. Um, yeah. And it sounds like hmm, there's almost a provenance for for um, root data in in the sense that if somebody augments or edits or enhances the data on on a root, yeah, how do you record that? Do you bother recording that? Um, hmm. Yes, yeah, that too. Yeah. Um, So just looking at the Ramblers, which I've just linked to here, um, this is another very thin one. And so the Ramblers are an interesting case because not everything is open from the Ramblers. So if you're a member, you get more information than you get if you're not. So it's not entirely open data. Again, this one's, this was interesting because it's quite thin. You get a start location, you get a root summary, which tells you that you will get caught up in the legend of Robin Hood. So it's maybe not the most actionable, um, information you get, but presumably it's well marked. Um, and then you get some, some sort of very bare information about, about who can do it um, with some images, but it is fairly well annotated in terms of who's responsible for creating the data in the first place. Um, so there's that level of richness there. Uh, but again, it really is just a starting point. Um, is there a sense that this is characteristic of easier routes that if you're British cycling or Sustrans or something like that, and you've got a fairly complicated or arduous route, you'd give more information about it. Whereas if it is in the case of, for instance, the Forestry England site or the Rambler site, you say, you know, it's an easy route. Um, here's about how long it takes. Here's where you start. Um, is that enough for the easy level, but the amount of data you need increases as the route gets more difficult? I think one of the, um, it's Helen here, one of the things about the Forestry England one that you picked up, and I guess I can see it now when you were looking at the one, the Kent one, is that that route is, atta that, that, um, route is attached to a location. So all the, a lot of the data around the parking and, you know, all those kind of other bits of data, they're, they're in a different part. They're not on that page. Do you see what I mean? Right. Because that, that page is attached to a location. Oh, so you th the user journey is is that you go to the location and which has things like the parking and all the all the kind of information that you're talking about and then you click on the route so that's why they're so simple because it's they you've already done all of the other bits right okay you so know that's one of the reasons why they're quite simple so context is quite important really whether they're sort of 
like in a search engine for all routes, in which case all that peripheral information you need, or whether they're on a site where the peripheral information is held more centrally. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah. Mm. I was just I was just looking at mine now, thinking, oh, if you were if you were pulling it from that one page, nobody would know where to go or locations or directions or anything, because it's not on that particular page. So that's, that's right. what I was thinking. If you want to Sherwood Pines um, mm. at that level, yeah, then it's all there, um, and it's a much richer. Ex it also kind of implies that you could you could. It's interesting that the co-location there becomes important. That you could go to Sherwood Pines and then you could go walking or you could go cycling. Um, and you could make the decision sort of at that point. Um, yeah, and there'll be a number of cycles and a number of walks in the one location. Yeah, so that's interesting. Because um, I'd imagine that's important for a lot of families and or weather dependency. That sort of, you know, <laughs> you're not necessarily committed to doing the eight mile hike because you've got a range of other things. Yeah, exactly. It depends how long your visit is and how easy you want to make it. Okay, that's a very interesting point, right. One, one thing which I think is kind of linked to that, which I, I, I know from previous conversations I've had with people from the likes of the National Trust, and I'm sure is, I'm sure is also relevant for forestry, is um, some routes you might connect into sort of different, so you might have like, if you think about like you go around a National Trust house, normally they have like the short route that just takes you sort of like 20 minutes to maybe go around the garden. But then there's kind of bits which start off on the same route, but then you turn left instead of right, for example, and that turns into a bigger route. And I think the National Trust have called those sort of trails. So ones that you might either, um, so you might create one for, um, I think, oh, maybe it was forestry. I'm going to get them all mixed up now, but I know someone did something around the Gruffalo. I think that might have been forestry, actually. Um, so there was kind of bits of, of different routes that they connected so it's actually yeah, that's right. so we do that yeah yeah exactly so sorry i'm not giving attributing it to the national trust it's not them at all it's you guys um yeah, no, it's for forestry england everybody <laughs> sorry, sorry, and a very sorry. good trail it is too yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah no, uh, that's my fault <laughs> muddled up. um yeah so um that's an interesting thing i mean I, I know that's slightly different but the way you start to piece together different trails is also like an interesting kind of because it Theoretically, nothing's stopping you from going left or right, assuming you can actually go left or right, let's say. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, that's interesting. And how you capture that information is interesting too, because it's, you know, it's implicit if you've got geo information. Um, but yeah, textually, it depends upon, you know, information architecture of the website right now. Okay, so how we capture that is a really vital question. Um, further, any, any anything further to say on that point? Nick, sorry, you're very quiet. I can't really hear you. Sorry, the architecture of the website is uh, maybe uh, it's it's definitely good to take into account. But obviously, with the data, we, um, as with the other feeds, you'd probably put it all into one data item. So you would link off the place in the example of Sherwood uh, Forest to the route. So you'd have both of those there. Um, but but absolutely good to realize that they're the same thing. And I'm, I'm wondering whether a lot of the place data could be the same field. Mm. So. We can pick that up for discussion um, or, well, a subsequent one. So just, I'm just going to see, because time is slightly passing. Um, take a look at some of the more ones. Um, there was one which had a very extended, different approach. Let's see, was it? That's right, yeah. So this is the ordnance survey walk. Um, the very best of the Langdale Pikes. And what I thought was interesting about this was, um, first of all, of course, because it's from Ordnance Survey, there's lots and lots of geo information. And if you open with OS maps, if you click on that link, you get a really nice uh, map of elevation information that I couldn't really decipher. But clearly, if you're a map head, it's great stuff. Um, but then it's also got a very extended textual description in terms of waypoints. Um, that you get a nice big photograph and you get a nice textual description um, associated with each of these. Um, 
I'm not entirely sure of the function of this, how much this is about advertising, how much it's about wayfinding, um, whether there are particular kinds of ramblers who focus more on waypoints and those who focus more on map information. I just don't know why this information is here, uh, although I certainly enjoyed it very much. Um, but it did have, it did seem like there was, this was kind of a textual version of the segments that we talked about in the last call, um, that it's possible to segment trails in this way. I don't know what point I'm trying to make here <laughs> beyond <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> uh, but does anybody else have any other uh, comments on that? Uh, yeah, so on, so obviously that's, I mean, that's a, really sort of lovely example as well but they've also got kind of ones that are pretty much just the routes mm -hmm. if you um from i don't know where to, how did i get from there from on the top of that website that you just get to on there's like an explore near me button mm -hmm. and if you sort of type in for example london into the start point and click the button help me get outside mm -hmm. um it kind of get, brings you up a lot of walks that don't have that kind of information but you, again, you can open in OS maps. Obviously they're trying to push everyone to OS maps um, and, and kind of gives you similar sort of information. So leisurely, how far it is from you, the distance, how long it should take, any ratings. Um, it doesn't have all that kind of, all the pictures necessarily. Um, I'm not sure um, if it kind of tracks you as you're going around or anything like that, but um, that's kind of like a, a different way and uh, obviously having OS on the call um, I'm not sure which the majority of their routes fall into whether it's more into this kind of um, uh, list kind of function or uh, popping up, um, or whether it's more into that kind of more visual kind of almost storytelling way of, of presenting the data but um, this is another way that they have kind of displayed routes. Right and there's I guess it reemphasizes a couple of points already made, but maybe in more dramatic fashion that there's different levels of curation with each other. And it seems to depend on our way how much curation you get, how much you enrich the data. Um, and then also that the individual providers have got very different you know, data with each, with each route and each function. Um, and yeah, obviously, in some senses, is the, the gold standard but even they've got like, degrees of um, uh, richness in their data, yeah. Um, the other thing that sort of surprised me a little bit on Ordnance Survey, was they give a length, which is presumably uncontroversial, then they also give a duration of six to seven hours, and that's, that's true on a couple of the websites that they'll give a time to walk. Um, how useful do people feel that is and how much access do people have to that kind of data? Like, is it useful to have it as a, is it useful to have it at all in the first place, I guess? I think as a consumer, just thinking from the consumer point of view, you want to know roughly how much time you're committing to walking or cycling, whatever it is you're doing. Although obviously it's, it's um, I, I, I also think there's a sort of, uh, I might be speaking out of time, but I, I feel like there's a formula people use to sort of calculate how roughly how long these things take. Um, I might be wrong in that. Maybe someone else knows better than me, but um, uh, so I'm not sure whether that exists or whether I've made that up but, or read that somewhere. But um, uh, yeah, I feel like as a consumer, you'd probably want to know uh, roughly how long things would yeah. take. I, I would think that because it's, it's about, you, you might not be able to translate um, the length into your own walking time. So just even an indicative type figure right, is really useful when you're trying to make those sort of decisions about which one to do. So mm -hmm. how long have you got sort of thing? If you've only got 40 minutes, then you can categorize by that then. And we have it. It's really subjective because we'll have like cultural tours or it might be like a walk around a city and it's like, you know, pop into this museum or pop into that museum. And actually, it could probably take you an hour to walk it around if you just didn't go into any of the places. So, yeah, it's good to have a range or uh, uh, for the customer or the user to know that it's an approximation. 
Right, okay. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> not saying do exactly six point six miles in ten minutes or something. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, to answer to answer Izzy's question, um, just because I thought it was interesting. Uh, yeah, apparently I think it was the Ramblers did have a standard formula for calculating how long it would take, but it was all based around some guy from about 1870 and how long it took him. Um, yeah, you definitely called, read that same Guardian article. Than me then. <laughs> it's called Naismith's Rule, and it's uh, people can't keep up anymore, can they? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think uh, they were abandoning uh, Naismith's rule, weren't they? Sorry? I think they were abandoning Naismith's rule. I think that's why we're aware of it at all, is that it's no longer... No a thing, longer. yeah. <laughs> um, I've got to drop off the call now, um, but if uh, there's anything that comes up for me, feel free to just ping me a note afterwards and I, I'll pick it up. Sure. Well, the next, uh, the next point to address is... Oh, okay, actually, sorry. There is one point that I wish to raise with regard to the... Um, uh, with the sort of data exploration is just how do we describe grade? Um, it's, I couldn't see if there was a standard vocabulary. We had everything from easy access, strenuous, um, moderate, killy, um, and then 57 meter climb, uh, which I, I, yeah, I guess it's more important to the cyclists than to the runners a lot of the time. And then grade description three, which was presumably links into some kind of standard rating system for, for grades. Um, do people have any insight into how useful these are? Uh, if it's different audiences find these find these different ratings useful uh, and how which what range of audiences should we be catering for? Because it, it seemed quite hard to my mind to get a very unified uh, to compare these different descriptions to each other. They just seem pretty much incommensurate with each other. I think it's the, um, from our perspective, the serious cyclists want to know and we give them more technical information mm -hmm. because they'll choose their, their routes based on how difficult they want things to be and challenging and all that kind of stuff that's so quite important. I'm not sure it's quite so important on the sort of leisure type routes that we offer for walking. But having said, if there's anything standard, I don't know. If there's anything standard, because I, I I wasn't around when those those descriptions were put in, but I know they are important to that sort of sex section. You know, sort of more the adventure, the adventure type audience. Right. So that's interesting that you mentioned the adventure audience. Um, so is there a sense that there are there's two audiences, three audiences? Hundreds so of they're one of the seg segments within the organisation that we use, and they're the sort of yeah. The, the or, or thrill seekers or something I can't remember what it's called but you know they're the people who want to do the big big mountain biking type things and the, the tougher trails and challenge themselves okay and that would be very different to a family who would who would just be wanting to have a nice easy walk where they know there's toilets and a and a flat flat thing you know what I mean they're very different audiences oh, okay so that's so you you've got a formal segmentation then yeah, yeah. I'm not sure it comes out in the routes, but we just know that, that in, in, the, in some of the cycling routes, they need that technical information to make their decisions. Um, do you know of other formal segmentations? Anyone on the call or anyone in the room? Because um, that's, that's interesting that, um, yeah, Helen, would it be possible for you to share that, um, that classification and, and what, the, what the terms mean? Um, I can check. I don't know if it's business information or not, so I'd have to check, like the actual formal document. But I can I can find out for you and and share the bits that are relevant. Definitely. Okay, that would be that would be fantastic. Yeah, because um, it does seem there does seem to be such a, a big difference between or you know such a huge range basically of, of people who are engaged in these activities um, and and what they want out of them. Um, because we also have a segment which are kind of like the people that don't want to follow the way mark through way marks you know they want to go off piste all the time for example so right, the or, go to, or they they would choose something based on the fact how busy it was you know mm -hmm. how remote it was that kind of thing oh that's really interesting okay mm. um, 
Oh, and then somebody on the last call, I can't remember who it was, but was talking about desire lines, about the tendency to um, shortcut things. Um, and yeah, capturing, capturing the difference between the root as designed and the root as walked and that kind of thing. Um, uh, okay, uh, I think the only sort of general point I'll raise before moving on is just that there's also a, some crowdsourcing capacity on some of the websites. Sometimes it's user comments on roots. Sometimes it's um, a little bit more involved than that in that it's, it's actually sort of users who create the roots and submit them. Um, so it's worth thinking in advance a little bit about how much we want to facilitate that kind of or support that kind of activity. Um, so given that we've got 12 minutes on the call, I'm just going to tentatively raise the next point, um, which is that talking, talking to Nick and talking on the last call, uh, it did seem like we want to have a use case meeting for everybody who's got use cases basically uh, in, the, in the very near future, um, because we do need to push the specification out fairly quickly. Um, ideally, we would have, we would make it possible for people to start publishing roots data openly by the end of July. So that means things have to march along fairly quickly. Um, so I'll just flag up to you now that ideally we'd like to get as many people as possible uh, at, a, at some kind of central meeting in London by the end of June. Um, Obviously, I'll send around a doodle poll and some more formal way for people to indicate their availability in the near future. But as a straw poll, how crazy does that seem to people on the call? Uh, it seems fine for me. Okay, cool. Is there anybody who's thinking, end of June, that's crazy. Nobody will be available on that kind of short notice. Um, hello, can can you hear me? Uh, is Helen? I can hear I can hear Helen and I can hear Tom Marley on my screen. Hi there, yeah, I was just going to pipe in. I've not said much on this call because it's a bit out of my scope. I've just been listening uh, in the background, but yeah, that that sounds sounds good to me at the back end of June. Okay. Yeah, the back, the back, the I, I think what would I would need to do is, is find the most relevant people to attend because you know I'm I'm not the internal expert on this actually because I come from the website background but um, with notice I think it would probably be fine but the better more notice the better. Right. Yeah. Okay, we will get that into shape and those invitations into shape as absolutely as soon as possible then. Um, so the link that's on that slide is to the outcomes of the booking spec meeting that we had, when was it? Over a year ago? Yeah, um, just over a year ago. The outcomes that we'd be looking for would be some, would have the same general shape as that document. Um, so if you're, if you're talking to people in your organization about uh, who should go and who would be interested in attending, if you show them that document, you know that that's the kind of outcome that we'd be we'd be hoping to achieve. Um, yeah, yeah, this is distributed in the announcement. Yeah. Um, great. That's that's great. Thanks. Um, okay, and at that point, with uh, nine minutes to go, I will stop speaking and just see if anybody's got any other business they want to they want to raise. I'm getting shakes of the head from uh, Nick and Tim over here. Uh, so does anybody on the call have anything to flag up? Um, just if there was, um, sorry, I did miss quite a lot of that, but I, I just thought it was, it mentioned what the current kind of, is the spec released now or is it still waiting on more information? So when you say spec, you mean the booking spec? Booking or? spec, sorry, yeah, the booking spec. Of course, Tom, you're going to be asking about the booking spec. Um, <laughs> our spec is, uh, yeah, is, is pressing. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, that is, uh, it's, it, well, the official release date is uh, Friday. Yeah. Uh, we won't get any, we don't get any further. Um, if no one vetoes it, basically, by Friday, that's, that's where we are. 
Um, and so uh, no one has so far vetoed it. So I click out, out of office on and don't answer any phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, no, yeah. That sounds great. I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think, people, well, I don't know if anyone's scared to veto it or whether they're going to just do it at midnight on Thursday, just, you know, to see because they've only just read it. Uh, <laughs> that one's surprising. <laughs> But, um, but we've been having some great conversations about tooling and validation and all the, the great things we can do to support and documentation and the great things we can do to support implementers. Um, we've been awesome. having with um, early implementers as well. And um, so we're kind of get, there's a lot of ducks we're lining up in a row. Um, with any luck, uh, on Thursday, we'll be able to release the Kraken in that respect. Um, so we'll look out, look out for an email. All right, great work, guys. Apart from that, all good from my end. Okay, any other? Yeah, nothing from me. No, or me. Okay, uh, well, thank you for joining the call. Um, look out for that invitation in the very near future. Um, and hopefully see you all in London uh, very soon. And uh, yeah, I'll distribute notes on this call before the end of the week. And thank you again.